Hi everyone, Lee Burris here and welcome back to the show. In this episode, I'm joined by Yoshi Anram as we discuss his concept of leadership intelligence. I ask him, what is leadership intelligence? Why does it matter? And how can we apply it to our day-to-day -day lives to live our best lives and help others? We also discuss his book on this very topic, which is called Spiritual Intelligence Leadership, How to Inspire by Being Inspired. You can grab Yoshi's book by clicking the link in the show notes, which will take you through to Amazon. And it's also available in various other bookstores as Yoshi shares towards the end of today's episode. So without further ado, let's hop on over into my conversation with Yoshi. Yoshi, welcome to Raising Consciousness. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, how, are you, how are you doing? Doing pretty well. I'm I'm delighted to be here and honored to be here and I'm behind the same goal for raising consciousness. So let's see how our consciousness shows up and how we can raise it and help each other in the process and maybe help some of our listeners. I love that. I love that. Um really fascinated to dive into some of the topics that we're going to be covering today. Um before we kind of you know explore all of that and the questions I have about you and your work, etc. Um, I, I, usually, I usually like to start episodes by um, understanding my guest a, a bit better. So, and the work that you do. So, with that in mind, like, who is Yossi? Why do you do what you do? And um, actually, what do you do as well? Okay, good. Well, I could take the rest of our time telling the whole story, but let's <laughs> see if I could do it. <laughs> Oh, because we're we're covering my my entire life essentially that led me to this point, and uh, that's uh, that's more than a second and a half, but um, or more than a couple of decades. I'm I'm kidding because I'm I'm a lot older than a couple of decades, but I'll just say this. So I grew up and was raised in in Israel, uh, like all young men, was uh, drafted into the Israeli military. Uh, luckily, it was a peaceful time, but despite my pacifistic leanings, I was drafted there. I mean, obviously, there's going a lot going on in that part of the world right now, and I, I don't want to get into that. Um, but I will just say that... Um, <clears throat> You know, the military was a formative experience in my life. Uh, I was lucky that it was relatively peaceful when I served, although the class ahead of me in high school got hit with the 73 war, and I lost some friends in that, which was uh, raised existential questions for me about the meaning of life and, you know, and the fact that we can all go. We never know when we can go. And um, so that that question kind of has continued to to linger in me what we have a limited time in our lives we we never know how how long it is and how do we create meaning in in the small amount however um, amount we do have but anyway as far as the military service i was uh, i entered as a shy introverted kid who was good in math and science and so on never thought i would be uh, in that environment, but somehow I had the fastest promotion record in the history of my regiment and won all these leadership awards. Um, so that kind of was strange, but um, and uh, but despite my success, the military command and control model um, chafed at my soul. And while I'm, I understand that it's effective and some required in battle, it's, it's uh, not really the thing that necessarily inspires. Uh, creativity and, and all kinds of other things that are particularly required in our modern world where you have knowledge workers and, and creative people and all kinds of domains, um, people whose judgment and knowledge is required for the effectiveness of their jobs, whether it be as software engineers or graphic designers or doctors or attorneys or drug research developers, whatever it is. So uh, that kind of led me to being interested and inspired and motivated to someday see if I can uh, lead a, build and lead an organization based on more humane values that support the growth and actualization of people's potential as individuals and their uniqueness, but in the context of a team environment or an, a community or an organization. So that led me to this... Uh, aspiration to be an entrepreneur. So I followed my dream. I came to the U.S. I went to the top schools. 
I came IT and Harvard, and and then from there I ultimately was fortunate enough to start a company, and the first company was called Individual Inc. And you would get Luke's morning newspaper on your fax machine that was individually tailored to you. This is many people don't know what fax machines are. They're obsolete technology these days. Um, but this this was in the late 80s, early 90s, well before the Internet. Uh, but it was using machine learning software, and you would be able to tell the uh, our system which articles were relevant or not, and based on that would tune the profile and get you more relevant uh, stories, scanning all the wire services and, and trade journals. Um, so it saved people time. They got more timely information. They got things individualized to them. Um, and and so on. But the, the concept of individual, the name individual stood for both an organizational philosophy, supporting the growth of each individual in this community context, as well as the personalization of the news, which now is kind of standard. Uh, you have your your Google News or whatever that's personalized to you. Uh, it knows your profile, looks at your click history and gives you more articles that, that are relevant to you and so on. But this this was early on, uh, originally delivered via fax, but I was so passionate about the company, I was working 70, 80 hours a week, which ultimately led to my burnout and clinical depression, and you might say uh, also dark night of the soul where some of this kind of lost its meaning for me, and I was very scared with the Internet coming on that our fax-based subscription model was going to get cannibalized, and we had to kind of switch, even though the business model, but even though we had sort of the profiles of our customers, uh, which was going to be a gold mine for the advertisers, we had to can build a much larger audience on a free basis for the news, and that meant cannibalizing our own uh, revenue stream. Uh, and that was very scary for me. And, and as a result, I kind of went into this depression and sense of, of, of meaninglessness, et cetera. Lo and behold, I mean, through therapy, through Prozac, psychoactive medications, I, I emerged out. We changed the direction of the company to be an Internet company. We started growing, uh, and I ultimately took the company public um, and was worth, you know, lots of money, et cetera. But along the way, my mother passed away, and um, and I had some other uh, challenges, Um but I was always interested in sort of the relationship of mind and the body, consciousness and matter. And, um, you know, at, at some point when I was getting a massage, trying to relax with all the stress, um, I had sort of an awakening experience where I experienced my body and, and everything made of consciousness. And there was no separation between mind and body or consciousness and matter, subject and object. And the floor that I was looking at through the cradle just felt like it was part of me, it was within me. So I experienced, you know, sort of this awakening sense of oneness, which blew the, my mind circuits. And, um, you know, it also threw me into a manic episode. I, I was getting all these downloads about the, the future and the direction of the Internet, uh, a lot of which became true and actualized in, with what companies like Google and Facebook have done. And I was trying to get my company individual to, to be the one doing that, but that required changing and moving very fast. And I was very consumed by, by this vision. And as I mentioned, um, I was ungrounded and, and somewhat and, and quite manic, frankly. Uh, so I wasn't taking any any no for an answer from my team or my board, that we need to slow down, we need to focus, it was all, everything had to be done yesterday. And that ultimately led to the board putting me on a leave of absence, a quote unquote voluntary leave of absence that wasn't voluntary at all. So it was kind of a, a trauma and uh, there were headline stories in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journals that I was, pushed out and I was emotionally unstable and that was very shameful because it excluded me from this higher echelon of CEOs and venture capitalists in Silicon Valley that I was a part of 
and people that were seeking my company and affiliation no longer responded to my phone calls and emails, etc. So that, that was a big trauma uh, that, uh, that was very painful. Uh, somehow I recovered. I was involved in starting another company and had to prove myself and took that second company, also public. Uh, but along the way, I was more and more interested in what this experience was about. Why did I get depressed? What was this experience of oneness? And I was also mentoring and helping other entrepreneurs as a as a founding investor, an angel investor, and uh, wanted to work deeper with people. So eventually, I changed the direction of my life, and I went back to school and became a psychologist. Uh, working with people. And so these days I'm a psychologist, I'm a CEO leadership coach, and I'm a researcher. So um, when I went back to school, I was trying to understand what had happened to me from a spiritual perspective and how much of that was real, how much of that was just kind of delusion. And uh, <clears throat> so I've heard of this term, uh, spiritual intelligence, that was formulated by this woman called Dana Zohar, uh, well before me and uh, in 1997, but she never really defined or operationalized what it is and how to measure it. And I was very familiar of the concept of emotional intelligence and all the research that was done to show how emotional intelligence contributes to leadership and life quality and all kind of positive outcomes. Um, and uh, so I set on a path to understand what is spiritual intelligence. And that was a multi-year research project. To, and it started out with interviewing 71 teachers across all the world's traditions to see uh, how they embody spirituality in their daily life and how that helped them. And these were people <clears throat> that were nominated for their embodiment and walking the talk of their traditions. So I had people that were Buddhists and Hindu and Christians and Muslims and, uh, you know, Taoists, etc., across all the world's traditions. And what was really heartening and exciting was that regardless of their theology and metaphysics and cosmology, the virtues of purpose and service and gratitude and integrity and humility and intuition and higher self were common. And that started to form the foundation of these qualities. And then I was also aware that in uh, the modern scientific paradigm of positive psychology, these very qualities were also shown to be contributing to, to well-being and, and so on. Uh, so from there, I went on and developed the first academically validated measure of spiritual intelligence, and then I looked at how that contributes to leadership. And I did a study with 42 CEOs and 210 members of their staff, and I found that leaders that scored higher on spiritual intelligence led teams that had higher morale, uh, greater commitment, and lower turnover. And that was after controlling for emotional intelligence. And it turned out that the two were complementary and reinforcing. So they each had a unique contribution, but to combine, they had a bigger contribution. Um, and then since then, there's been other studies with follow-on researchers uh, that found that spiritual intelligence contributes to all kinds of qualities of outcome like quality of life, relationship satisfaction, productivity at the individual and the group level. And in fact, leaders with higher spiritual intelligence uh, produce better financial results for their organizations. So uh, that kind of all leads me to uh, what I do today. As I mentioned, I'm a psychologist. I work as a therapist. I work as a leadership coach, which for me spans the, the leadership domain, the, the therapy domain, and the spiritual growth domain because I hold this bigger uh, framework of spiritual intelligence. And I have done all this research around spiritual intelligence, pioneering research uh, that has since received a thousand academic citations. So uh, as I see my calling, my purpose, my personal mission is to awaken greater spiritual intelligence in the world and, and in myself. And that's a lifelong journey. Um, and I think it's what's needed for humanity facing the current existential 
crisis that, that we're facing at, at many levels. And uh, I think we need what I call a Copernican revolution uh, in the shift of consciousness from an ego-centered way, like c before Copernicus, we used to think that the Earth is at the center of the solar system or the universe because when you look at the sky, it looks like the sun moves through and um, the Earth is stationary. But now we understand no, that the Earth comes out of the sun the en and the energy of the sun feeds uh, all life on Earth. And the Earth doesn't have a separate existence, so to speak. Uh, but the ego view is that I'm a separate individual and you're a separate individual and uh, we compete in a doggy dog world with scarce resources. That's the egoic perspective. Mm. But the Copernican revolution of consciousness that we need to go through is to understand that we come out of the oneness, that we're all interconnected and interdependent. And I don't have an existence on my own. I couldn't survive without the farmers, without the trees that give me oxygen and, and, and so on. So that's what my friend Steve Farrell at Humanity's team calls the Galileo moment. And I'm calling the, the Copernican revolution. And um, so we have to have this momentary awakening to shift the perspective for a moment. But then it's a lifelong work to change the habits and rewire ourselves and build the practices and the skills to embody these qualities that naturally would emerge from that, which is the sense of purpose and service and gratitude and beauty and joy and humility and integrity and so on. So it's not enough to have a momentary awakening. We have to, you know, uh, cultivate these qualities. And, and that that's, uh, that's a long path. And so that's what I'm here to help myself and everybody else do thank you so much for for sharing that um so many questions kind of off the back of that one thing i did definitely want to touch on um and you kind of um alluded to it there was what your work is around spiritual intelligence um because when i came across your work and actually your book I, i've seen your book kind of on this topic i was actually wondering like what is it and what does it mean and how can it be applied to like the quote unquote average person you know in their day-to-day -day lives because we hear of emotional intelligence as you're saying right but spirit, spiritual intelligence is not something that we hear too much of and it sounds like forgive me if i'm wrong that spiritual intelligence is a combination of different qualities like having purpose and meaning in, in your in your life um and then i guess living that like applying that on a day-to-day -day basis um is 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 that correct like what we actually what is spiritual in intelligence and how can it be uh applied yeah no it's great so um so it's good that everybody now is familiar with emotional intelligence but to step back and define it uh, essentially emotional intelligence is the ability to draw on emotional resources and information to help manage and influence our own and other people's emotions okay so uh, that's kind of the classical definition. Um, and so by analogy, spiritual intelligence is the ability to draw on and embody spiritual qualities and resources in daily life to help functioning and well-being in daily life. So, uh, and as we mentioned, these would be qualities like purpose and service and gratitude and humility and integrity and 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 so on. Sorry, is, I'm sorry for interrupting. I'm wondering, is there like a certain yeah. number of qualities that you use in your, or that you found from your research, obviously from all the interviews you've done, maybe you mentioned them in your book, um, or are they kind of limitless, kind kind of within that sense? And and you, you know, um... what I un what I uncovered in my research uh, was was 22 uh, qualities, and then they they cluster into certain domain domain of meaning. Uh, a domain of, of grace, a domain of presence, a domain of truth, a domain of wisdom, and so on, and under each of those domains. So uh, there, there are multiple qualities. Now, of course, you can, you can break it out and, uh, and, and refine it. Let's just say one of them might be mindfulness or, or presence. And so you say, well, under mindfulness, there's mindfulness of our body sensations, mindfulness of our emotions, mindfulness of our uh, thoughts, mindfulness of our dreams, and, and so on. So 
Yeah, you can you can refine and break it down. It's just how you how you uh, you know pull it together. But the important thing is to whether it's twenty two or twenty four or twenty five or you know it, it it's it it at some level becomes a little bit a question of semantics and where you draw the boundaries. But I think the important distinction to make is. Um, is between spiritual intelligence and spiritual experience and spiritual belief. So a spiritual uh, intelligence, as I said, has to do with the embodiment of these qualities in daily life, uh, unlike a spiritual experience where I'd be meditating and maybe I'd have a, a, an ego-dissolving moment or 10 minutes or whatever it might be. I'd feel oneness or, or what have you while I'm meditating or walking in the forest. That's a spiritual experience. Uh, and or I may have a spiritual belief like we're all one or I may have a belief in higher power like God or reincarnation or you know the immortality of the soul or whatever these are all spiritual beliefs and they you know different traditions have different uh, beliefs and, and theologies and uh, etc but spiritual intelligence is not about the belief uh, I mean you might have the belief but you know, it's about embodying these qualities while you're driving on the freeway and while you're shopping in the supermarket or you're relating to your family members or, or co-workers at work. And um, basically, the more compassion you bring, um, you know, the more effective you'll be in your connection with others. The, the greater the sense of purpose you have and you follow your calling, the more <clears throat> meaning and fulfillment you have in your life. And the other thing that's important to understand is then it means that somebody could be spiritual intelligence regardless of where they fit on the spectrum from being an atheist who doesn't believe in, in any quote-unquote spiritual domain or, or, or things, or someone who's uh, spiritual but not uh, religious, or somebody who is a devout religious person. And I've had clients across the entire spectrum. And... Uh, also, it's important to understand that these are different dimensions of spiritual intelligence. Uh, much like in emotional intelligence, there's uh, different dimensions about awareness of my emotions versus others' emotions, self-regulation. Other, So some people could really score high in spiritual intelligence on, on the purpose domain and and maybe on the mindfulness domain, but not so high on compassion or or something else. So... Uh, I don't know anybody who scores, you know, at the top or has no no opportunity to grow on some dimensions. But, you know, that's not different than an IQ score where you have a verbal score and a mathematical score and a, a speed of processing score and and what have you. And your IQ is, is a compo composite score uh, of all of those. So, you know, but... It's less, uh, I'm less interested in giving people a, a number, but more like to understand, okay, you know, my, my strength is I, I bring a greater sense of purpose to my life and that gives me meaning and I'm motivated by service. But, you know, where I really can grow is in the domain of intuition or where I can really grow is in the domain of presence. You know, we go, we're also challenged in presence because we're getting text messages, emails, short clip videos, you know, there's so much coming at us and competing for our attention. So, you know, somebody can have a great sense of purpose, but, you know, they may still be challenged by in in their presence. And so I'm just giving yeah. you some example. It's a multidimensional construct. And, um, you know, we have the opportunity to grow in all these dimensions. What does, from your research, what does science say about spiritual intelligence? It sounds like from your, from, from a lot of your research, obviously going around the different uh, cultures and traditions, um, like that's very, so I kind of understand that as like more uh, kind of ancient wisdom, I guess, you know, um, but what does like more the science say? Because I think like a lot of these things with like purpose and service, right? Um, how these things help us and, and yeah what kind of modern science i say guess and i guess kind of say about about, about these qualities and like how they help us to live 
Uh, well, they bring in about a greater satisfaction of life, greater mm. fulfillment, greater quality of life, uh, healthier relationships, uh, more satisfaction in our relationships, more effective leadership, uh, you know, so on. So the, these are uh, some of the, and there's been many, many studies now done by different ref, different researchers, some, some of them using my measure of spiritual intelligence, which, as I mentioned, is the first academically validated one. But there's been since uh, a few others that have been proposed by other researchers. And so, uh, but the science seems to suggest that in general, uh, people's spiritual intelligence intelligence is positively impactful across multiple domains of, of human endeavor. In terms of purpose, because, um, you know, that's come up a few times, you know, I'm someone who, you know, uh, meet me um, probably eight to 10 years ago, you know, and I was there questioning my purpose, you know, and um, my, the question of like, why am I here to, you know, type of thing in these big life questions. What's your take on purpose? Like, and what I mean by that is like, how do people find like is purpose something we find is it something that we discover is it innate within us and we just need to come to our uh like comes that realization um at the right time the right moment yeah, you know what, what's your take on purpose and how people find discover you know whatever it is like what what their purpose is because i think that's a that's a, a big question for for uh, a lot of people I, I know it was for me yeah no it's a great question i think it is one of the hallmarks of or one of the key qualities of of spiritual intelligence is to have a deeper sense of purpose um I mean, I think of it as, as kind of the intersection of, of several uh, legs or it rests on, on several stools. One is, you know, we have to re realize that each of us are unique individuals, um, that, you know, 14 billion years into the evolutionary history of the universe, there's never been someone like Luke or, you know, Yossi in this incarnation or, or uh, what have you. And so life endowed you and everybody with a unique set of talents, gifts, and you might call superpower. Some people's talent lies in being a great musician. Someone else's in being a great programmer, being very whatever, a great listener or great something else. Um, so first we, you know, we have to recognize that each of us are endowed in life by, by a unique set of gifts. And um, now if you give someone a gift, let's say you have a friend and you give him a gift. And, uh, and then, you know, a few months later you found out they never opened it or they opened it and they threw it in the trash. They never use it. You're going to be disappointed, right? You gave him a gift whatever it might be, you'd like him to, to use it, make, make good use of it. That's why you gave him that gift. So when life gives us a gift, you know, a certain set of talents, it wants us to use it to, to, to enhance life, to enjoy it. So, so I think, you know, in finding our purpose, we first have to uh, become aware what are our gifts. And then secondly, we have to look at uh, and naturally, when something is our gift, we we are good at it, you know, because we're not going to be fulfilled. Let's say I, I enjoy, you know, singing, but, you know, my gift is really not singing. My voice is not that great. So that might be a fun hobby. I may be singing in the shower, but it's not going to be my purpose to be a singer because, you know, nobody's going to enjoy it that much. Like my kids tell me, oh, dad, you know, stop singing. Your your voice is pretty bad, right? Uh, so I, I wouldn't want to make that my my profession because I'm not going to get good feedback and I'm not going to contribute that much. So we want to find our gifts that we're good at and then look at how we can use them to contribute. Because um, when we contribute with our gifts, we're going to feel... Uh, good about ourselves because we're effective and good at it. We're going to get positive feedback and it's going to make a contribution to others. And all the research shows that, you know, the lasting fulfillment and happiness comes when we actually contribute to others. So there's, I'll just throw a quick uh, study that was done. So you, you take a bunch of people and into an experiment and you say, okay, you know, here's a lottery you either win $20 or you don't, okay? And half the people say win $20. 
I'm sorry, it could be euros or whatever currency we, you want to be uh, talking at, um, but I, I'm, I'm here in the U.S. thinking in dollars. So, but you win, you win 20 pounds, euros or dollars or whatever. Um, so most people, when they win 20 dollars, are going to be happy for a moment, right? So that's fine. That's great. But then you divide you divide the the half that won the money into two groups randomly assigned, and you tell half of them, "Okay, you won this twenty dollars. You go and spend it on yourself, something that that you like to do with it." And then the other half, you tell, you take this twenty dollars and you go use it to to help someone else. You know, you could buy a meal to a homeless person. You could buy a gift to a friend, whatever you want to do, but it's not for you to, to be spent on you. It's for you to use to, to help someone else, okay? So then, so you got basically half of the half going to spend it on themselves, half of the half using it, quote-unquote, to service. And then you look at people's moods at the end of the day. Well, what do you find? The people who spend the $20 on themselves have no lasting elevated mood. They had a momentary joy when they won the $20, okay, and then they went and spent it on themselves. But at the end of the day, they're kind of like back to normal, so to speak. But the people who spend that $20 to help someone else have a lasting elevation in their fulfillment, happiness, and fulfillment from that day. So that tells you that when we act in service and contribution to others, it gives us lasting fulfillment and happiness. And um, so that's why, so going back to the elements of finding your purpose, it's find your gifts. That's why life gave it to you and you want to use it. And then you want to use it to contribute to others. And then you're going to be getting good feedback about it because you're good at it and you're effective if you have a great voice or you're a great programmer or you're a great you know, graphic designer, whatever it is, you're going to get good feedback and it's contributing to others. So, um, so it lines up your values, your joy, your competency, and your contribution. And when all of those things line up, that you're making a contribution in a way that's meaningful to you uh, and you're drawing on your gifts and you're getting good feedback and, and you're, you're, you're competent at it and, and you enjoy it, that, that gives you a sense of purpose. Now, the other piece that, that adds some complexity is that it has to support you in some way financially. So, you know, uh, you, have to, you have to bring that piece together, and that's a whole other thing, which is why it's not so easy, you know, um, to really find our calling, our purpose, um, in a way that, um, that is fulfilling on all these dimensions of drawing on our gifts, making a contribution, enjoying it, and then also supporting ourselves at a reasonable level of lifestyle that... that that you know we we could do let me pause there but i I can actually continue on that uh because i just came across a a research study that really (laughs) i found really shocking and very delighting about this whole question of the money piece and how it relates to purpose so but let me pause there and then i'll I'll continue yeah we'd love to dive into that i mean before we do so actually one of the questions i had was that i was going to follow up with with what you just said with that there, was so it sounds like our gifts is like one of the first steps of discovering what our gifts are, but how do people discover what their gifts are? So maybe if we, if you kind of answer, kind of tackle that question, like actually if people, you know, listening to this, if they're on the train or on, on their way to work and maybe they're working a job that they hate, right? And they actually don't know what their, what their gifts are, what they're good at. Maybe, you know, their current job is all that they've known, right? Um, and they don't like it, you know, I was definitely in that boat. But what words of wisdom would you share with them in terms of finding their gifts? And then, yeah, how would they then turn that those gifts into a into a financial model that would support them? Okay, no, it's a good question. So I think two things, how do you fi- how do you identify your gifts? One is you do an inquiry inward and you could just open your journal and start writing with the sentence stem 
one of my gifts is, one of my gifts, talents, or superpowers is, and then you complete it, whatever comes up. One of my gifts, talents, or superpowers is, you know, listening to people. One of my gifts, talents, or superpowers is curiosity. One of my gifts, talents, superpowers is, you know, problem solving. One of my gifts, talents, superpowers is, is mathematics. One of my gifts, talents, superpowers is creative drawing, whatever, for each person. They can look inside. I think most people will identify some of their gifts. So that would be one piece. The other one is to ask around people that know you, that are your friends, your family. Hey, what, as you've seen me over the years, what, what do you find that I am good at? You know, I know we're shy and we're supposed to be humble, etc., and we don't want to be boastful, but there's nothing wrong by like, hey, I'm, I'm doing some soul searching and I'm trying to figure out where I want to apply myself. As you've known me over the last five years at work or whatever, what, what do you find that I'm particularly good at? Oh, you're a great listener. Oh, you're a very compassionate person. Or, you know, uh, you're, you're, you're very creative or, you know, you're just present, you know, when I'm with you, I feel safe, I feel comfortable, you know, people are going to tell you, people uh, that know you, that care about you, ideally are not going to be bashful to tell you what they see you good at and, and excelling at. So I think it's both reflection and asking and, you know, of course you could do aptitude tests and you can go to a career consultant and all this other stuff, uh, but... I think you start with something much more basic through an inquiry, mm -hmm. self-inquiry, reflection, and then asking the, those closest to you. And then how does one, let's just say they've discovered their gift through that, right? Like how, how does one then, I mean, maybe they have an idea on how that can be of service contribution to others, and you know, they go through these steps, but then it becomes the big question of, ah, oh, shit, you know, I've got bills to pay, right? <laughs> like, you know, how, how do I... Uh, how, how, how do I um, support myself with, you know, through my purpose and, and yeah. stuff? Yeah, so that, that's a great question, which goes back to what I was saying. So, yeah, so you, you identify your gifts and then you identify what you're passionate about, right? I mean, I could be a good listener. I want to be a therapist, but, you know, I could go do that with different audiences. Who can I relate to? What aligns up with my values, etc.? So... So uh, it's a multi-stage, multifactorial equation. Um, but then the last piece is, is we're starting to talk about is, is the financial piece and, and the livelihood piece, uh, which also has to fit in uh, unless, you know, we, we're born into some trust money or we won the lottery or whatever, in which case we don't have to worry about it. But most, most people do have to worry about it. Um, so th this is what I just came across recently that just kind of blew my mind up. There's another study. Um, so uh, they looked at 1,500 people over 20-plus year study, and uh, they, they categorized them to see what was their primary motivation. Uh, you know, was it money and, and career success? or uh, following their passion. And out of the 1,500 people, 200 people kind of in, the, in their youth, relative youth, said, no, I, I am just focused on following my passion, whether it, whatever it might be. And then uh, 1,250 or so, I'm rounding the numbers, okay? So roughly one out of the six people said, you know, I don't really care. I'm, I, I don't want to be, I'm not too concerned about practical. I just need to follow my passion. And that was 250 people. And then the other five, six, the 1,250 out of the 1,500 said, no, I, I really need a career success. I need to be practical. I I want to build a family, I need to, I want this kind of lifestyle, I want to have a house in the suburbs and two cars and blah, 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 and take vacations and to, to nice places. And so, okay, so then, so you've got 1,500 people divided in two groups, 250 and 1,250. And then they looked at that, those 1,500 people 20 years later. Out of the 1,500 people, 
a uh, hundred or so, actually a hundred and one became millionaires. Now let me ask you, how many in that hundred out of the 250 that said, I'm following my passion, how many do you think became millionaires? And how many out of the 1,250 that were focused on money and uh, became millionaires? So how, how, would, how is that 100 people that became millionaires, wh which groups did they come from? A hundred of the 101 came from the people who were interested in passion. So 40, 100 out of 250 became millionaires. That's 40%. Of, okay. Yeah. And makes sense. one out of twelve hundred and fifty became uh, millionaires, and the people that were quote, quote unquote practical. So that's less than zero point one percent. I think that's pretty mind blowing, don't you think? Wow. Yeah. Um, especially you know within some segments of culture that where they say don't follow your passion right like you know you need to be practical and stuff and then when you just kind of bring that study it kind of just blows out of the water um is does just practicality play any part like in your opinion well i mean in following your passion you also need to be practical i mean you know you you, you have to be grounded in reality i mean so part of spiritual intelligence is truth and reality orientation so if, if you say, uh, there's a Sufi saying that says, trust in God and, and follow and tie your camel. So if you say, oh, I'm going to follow my passion, one, and one other spiritual principle is, is trust. And you don't just say, okay, I'm, I'm going to follow my passion. I'm, I'm going to become a musician. Uh, but I'm just going to sit and, and, you know, somehow become a great musician. No, you, you freaking have to practice music and uh if it, and 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 play your instrument and go to school and do what you need if but if it's your passion then you have the energy the motivation to pursue it so you're not passive you you still have to be practical and say okay if this is what i want to do i want to become a musician i want to do this or that the other i want to be a graphic artist that's what i love is is draw but okay then i, I still need to go to the to the right places where I acquire the skills and and uh, develop those talents and and uh, you know apply for jobs. I'm a, I'm not just going to sit at home and and say okay I've got I'm following my passion. I'm a great a graphic artist. No, you got to develop that talent. You got to go out there and and get some jobs or whatever it is. Yeah, I think that's what um, some people have the hard time understanding, like, universal principles of, like, the law of attraction. You know, I think, like, it's been misinterpreted of, like, you know, I'm just going to state what I want and then sit here and meditate on it and, not, like, not actually the universe will bring it anything. to me. Yeah, you know, so, uh, yeah. you know, so it is about, obviously, setting that intention. And, obviously, here we're saying deciding uh working for the processes of working out what your passion is etc but then actually doing it you know um yeah the, the law of but what are you willing yeah what are you willing to do to follow up on your intention and mm -hmm. uh and that's more empowering and when people follow up on what they intend to manifest then the universe collaborates but that goes back to what i said you know trust in god and tie your camel you don't just say well mm -hmm. i trust in god i'm gonna leave my camel untied and I'm going to go for a week and I'll come back and well, oh, it's gone. Well, God, what, what did you do? You know? Yeah. Your book, your book, uh, spirit, uh, um, spiritual intelligent leadership, how to inspire by being inspired. Uh, let's talk about that in the time that we have left. I'm assuming that you know, some of the concepts that we've spoken about here today are also in the book. But one question I did have is, what does it mean um, to you to to be inspired? What does it mean to be inspired? It's uh, it's some of the things we we've talked about is to to uh, connect to one's spirit essence and discover one's gifts and discover one's calling and and mission and and. Uh, be fired up and lit up about uh, manifesting that mm -hmm. and um so um yeah and then 
And then the point is that you have to be inspired before you inspire anybody else around you. You can't lead anybody else until and when you you lead yourself. So, um, yeah, being, I mean, the very word inspired is like, um, you know, it's like, first of all, the, the, there's two pieces, right? There's from spirit. What is spirit? Uh, spirit is from Latin. Spiritus is the life animating breath, right? The breath of life that animates us. So, so when you're inspired, you're enlivened, and, and it's like you have drawn in the animating breath of life, and then you're 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 enlivened. And uh, so, uh, you know, you could say the spirit of God is within you, or whatever, or whatever way you think about it. But the, the, I think the essence of it is to your life force. You know, we each have a sacred spark of life. You know, whether you call it your spirit essence or your soul or whatever, we we have a sac a sacred uh, spark, which which is where our life force emanates from. And so we need to ignite that spark and then fan the flame. And when we do that, then our, our life force comes into full expression and alignment and it just bubbles and radiates out through us, through this energy, through this enthusiasm, through this passion. So, um, yeah, I, I, I hope I'm kind of giving you a sense of what I'm meaning by feeling yeah. inspired. What you, Definitely. You're fired up, you're lit up, you're... You're ignited. Your your spark is 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 been lit up, and and uh, there's a big fire raging in you, a big passion for life. It um it reminds me of a conversation I was having with somebody else, you know. And I'm, I'm actually pleased you mentioned the, you mentioned their life force because um and I'll, I'll probably mess this up, but they were saying how if we actually just take a moment to think about it, like there's something innate within us that's like beating our heart right that's actually keeping us alive without us even having to consciously think about it right and like that's our life force like our true essence and actually we can tap into that to to as we're saying here or as you're saying now you know to be inspired right to to light us up and to actually i i like the saying like live full out kind of thing so uh so yeah i'm, I'm, I'm pleased that like, you've you've mentioned life force there because it's not something that i think we consciously think about like actually yeah you know there's something that's innate within me that is keeping me alive right that's beating my heart etc so um yeah no, breathing actually, me yeah i mean yeah. are you are you beating your heart or is the heart being beaten are you breathing mm -hmm. or being breathed i mean most of the time we're being breathed life breathes us thank god otherwise we we couldn't manage our digestion our breathing and our heartbeat in in any kind of conscious way it's not out of out effort, so it just. But you know, there's our there is the life force, but we wanna you know, as I said, life gifts us these things, and then we wanna express it naturally. Mm, absolutely. What haven't we spoken about on the topic of spiritual intelligence that you feel our listeners and people need to know? Well, I mean. Uh... We talked about purpose, we talked about the Copernican revolution of consciousness that we need to go through in, in understanding, uh, you know, shifting our identity uh, from ego centered to, to, to this uh, mystery that we are and this life force that, that's pulsating and, and vibrating through us. I mean, there's a lot more I could say about it, but one one other thing I would say is 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 the shift and when we understand uh, and shift from the ego perspective that views us as separate individuals um, competing in a world with scarce resources uh, and to to this spiritually intelligent perspective, you know we 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 start to see that some of the most important thing that we are all after in life is love. I think that's really what I see as one of the deepest motivations that human beings have is like oftentimes people who want to be successful in money or in career or fame, really they think that's their ticket to love. If I if I show so much success and I'll be worthy of my own love or other people's loves, I'll find my right romantic partner or even God will then love me, etc. Um so I think deep 
deeply we're motivated by love. And uh, but one thing we can realize that everything in most everything in the universe is 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 scarce. So if I have a hundred dollars in my pocket, I give you a dollar. You know, I have ninety nine left. I have one less. If I have a a big gallon of of milk, I give you a glass. I have you know uh, a glass less. But if I have a certain amount of love in my heart, and I share it with someone. You know, do I have less love left in? If anything, my heart's capacity for love is enlarged. Now, whether you give me love back or not, or in some way it comes back to me directly, no, it's just the very the very expression of love, which is the nature of our heart that wants to love, is is, is compassionate. It just feels good, and, and, and we feel more love, and we feel more enlivened. So... Um, I think that's important to to remember that uh, our nature is love. Our nature is to want to share and give that love, and that's 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 so joyful. So we can we can live in love, and we can radiate joy. Then, and that's really about what this thing I call awakening spiritual intelligence. So I host these monthly free events where we look at each. Of the qualities of spiritual intelligence. Actually, the next one is uh, about egolessness and uh, and the life essence, which is connecting to that sacred spark of life. Um, so people could join these events; they're free. Um, they're on the third Friday of the month, and then the recordings are available on my YouTube channel for free. If you can't join, you could still follow and do the exercises on your. Your own, so it's at Awakening Spiritual Intelligence is is my YouTube channel and where these recordings are available and there are other videos. So I'm just offering a little plug Matt, to resources that are free that people can use. To uh, we did one on intention, we did one on purpose actually. So there is a there is a whole talk about the topic of purpose and exercises to help people do that. So people are welcome to look at that channel and you'll find uh, an event that happened a few months ago that is recorded about the the issue of purpose, if it's of help to anybody. Lucy, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I feel like I've learned a lot about spiritual intelligence, a phrase, a word uh, that I wasn't too familiar with coming into the conversation, but I feel I leave our conversation more insightful and uh oh yeah on, on on what it is i particularly loved how you broke it down into spiritual intelligence spirit, spiritual experiences and spiritual beliefs and how um you know i found that really 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 impactful for me to understand the spiritual realm a lot your book where can people pick up your your your, your book and uh, and um, obviously they can check out your, your youtube as you just said but yeah where, where can people pick out pick up your book to learn more about this concept that we've been uh, learning about today well it's certainly available on all the online uh stores amazon and barnes and noble and and what have you uh some of the hard copies uh bookstores also carry it i i can't tell so check out with your local bookstore or any of your favorite online stores. You, you can get it. Soon I will have, uh, there is also the ebook version, and soon there'll be also an audiobook version, which I will be narrating myself. So um, I've been going through that. It's kind of fun. I thought it's going to be a drag to read my book, but I'm actually reading. I'm like, oh, that's, that's not bad. <laughs> Enjoying the process. <laughs> and I got it. And I guide people through the exercises there, and so yeah. it's it, it's also kind of fun. But uh, yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity and the questions and the curiosity, and I'm honored and um, that you found it helpful. So Absolutely. hopefully, some it, it affects one or, or more people, and then it just ripples out. I think we're all in this together, and so if this impacted you in some way that's helpful, then. Please go out and, and share that impact, um, whether it's through this podcast or my book or anything else. I, the, the most important thing is I want to see a world where people are inspired, connected, and, and enlivened and empowered. And so if, if in any small way this contributed, then that's my, that's my payoff.
Yoshi, thank you. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Yoshi as we have been exploring spiritual intelligence. A fascinating concept. I'm definitely going to be exploring more to help me live my best life and to show up as a better leader. I've learned a lot from Yoshi in this episode and I hope that you have too. Feel free to share what you learned from this episode on YouTube by leaving a comment below the episode. And don't forget that you can pick up Yoshi's book, Virtual Intelligence, New Shit, How to Inspire by Being Inspired on Amazon and available in other bookstores as Yoshi Share in this episode. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode of the podcast. Take care. See you later.